Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. In my last video, I measured a few luminance, RGB, and narrowband filters using my high-resolution spectrophotometer. If you missed that video, I'll put a link to it right here. Today, we are going to look at a few light pollution suppression filters. Those are broadband filters designed to increase the signal-to-noise ratio when capturing data from a light polluted area, specifically luminance data with a monochrome camera, or RGB data with a one-shot color camera. They are a replacement for luminance filters, which generally just block the ultraviolet and the infrared parts of the spectrum. My goal in this video is not to obsess over whether the filters I tested match the manufacturer's specs. Instead, I want to know which filter would give me the greatest increase in signal-to-noise ratio for my specific light pollution conditions on an average broadband target. And to do this, we'll first take a look at my local light pollution using my spectrograph. We'll see what it's made of, and there will be a few surprises along the way. Then we'll look at the transmission graph of a few well-known light pollution suppression filters that were lended to me by local amateur astronomers. This will allow me to decide which one would work best for me, and the result should apply to most major cities in the world. All right, let's get started. To capture the spectrum of my local light pollution, I configured my spectrograph to work in low resolution, and I mounted it in a vertical position using a jig designed by Christian Buil, the creator of the Solex and StarX projects. There is no optical element in front of the slit. I just placed a 3D printed 10 mm wide aperture stop to limit the measurement to a relatively small area of the sky around the zenith. I then took six 15 minute long exposures with this setup. To calibrate the 2D spectrum in wavelength, I captured the emission spectrum of a calibration lamp, in my case a neon argon bulb. And to calibrate it in intensity, I had to calculate the instrumental response of the spectrograph. Here is the calibrated 2D spectrum of my local light pollution. It is a grayscale image because I use a ZW ASI 533mm Pro, which is a monochrome camera. But since the 2D spectrum has been calibrated in wavelength, it is easy to colorize it. Once we've also calibrated the spectrum in intensity, we can obtain a spectral profile from that 2D spectrum. Let's take a closer look at the result. First, we can see a number of emission lines which show up as sharp peaks in the spectral profile. Some of those lines in the blue-green part of the visible spectrum are caused by mercury vapor lamps which appear bluish-white to the eye, while other emission lines, mostly in the yellow part of the spectrum, are due to low-pressure sodium lamps, which naturally have an amber color. We can also see a few emission lines caused by neutral atomic oxygen. That's the natural glowing of the Earth's atmosphere, and this phenomenon is called air glow, not to be confused with aurora borealis, or northern lights. In both cases, the same neutral oxygen atoms are involved, but the source of the energy that makes those atoms glow is completely different. In the case of the northern lights, the oxygen atoms are excited by high energy charged particles coming from the sun, whereas in the case of air glow, it is the daytime sunlight that causes those high altitude oxygen atoms to be energized. They carry that excess energy with them through the evening and slowly release it at night. And finally, the biggest contributors to light pollution, at least in my case, are LED street lights, which have been rapidly deployed throughout the city of San Jose in the last 15 years. That kind of light pollution is the worst for astronomers, but also for human health and the wildlife. First, it is a broadband emission, which means that it cannot be selectively filtered out. Second, you see this very high peak in the blue part of the spectrum? Remember that Rayleigh scattering is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the wavelength, which, by the way, is the reason why we perceive the sky as blue during the daytime. So all the energy contained in this blue peak is going to be scattered, and the entire night sky is progressively becoming more and more blue. This is a serious threat to human health, because it has long been established that blue light can disrupt sleep patterns. It is also a significant threat to wildlife, from insects to migratory birds. Thankfully, there are solutions. Well-designed fixtures should send all their light towards the ground, and newer so-called narrowband LED bulbs can emit light only in a very narrow part of the visible spectrum. And finally, LED bulbs can easily be dimmed or turned off because it does not make sense to light up an entire empty street or an empty parking lot all night long. 
Now that we know what my local light pollution is made of, let's take a look at a few popular light pollution suppression filters available on the market to see how they stack up. Remember that everything I'm about to say applies only to my local light pollution conditions. It is very possible that your own light pollution is quite different from mine, although I would assume that most large cities have heavily invested in LED street lights in the last decade. So this will probably apply to some of you out there. Feel free to share your personal experience in the comment section of this video. I was able to test several different LPS filters from IDAS. This first one is an older generation IDAS LPS D1 filter. You can tell that it's an older generation filter because the transmission is only about 85 to 88%. Whereas newer generation filters from IDAS, like this IDAS LPS P1 filter for example, have a transmission of 90 to 95%. And for comparison, here is the IDAS LPS P2. All of these filters were clearly designed before the rollout of LED streetlights because they cut all the mercury vapor and sodium emission lines, but unfortunately, most of the continuum emitted by LED streetlights goes right through. The popular Optolong L Pro has exactly the same design and unfortunately suffers from the same problem. These are very well-made filters. They perfectly match the specs published by their manufacturers, but I don't think that they will provide any significant boost in SNR when imaging from cities that have adopted LED lighting technology. And finally, just for kicks, let's take a look at Bader's neodymium filter, which I find rather strange. Sure, it's a UV IR cut filter that also rejects the part of the spectrum where low pressure or high pressure sodium lights emit the most, but other than that, I think it has a bit of a strange shape. Have you guys used this filter? What do you guys think? I'm curious, so let us know in the comments below. The filters we just looked at have a very wide band pass. Now let's look at light pollution suppression filters that are more selective. We will start with the Antlia Tri-Band Ultra filter. Here is what its transmission graph looks like. Again, this measurement matches exactly the manufacturer specs, which is good. Looking at this graph, I assume that this filter may actually provide a boost in SNR, especially when coupled with an OSC camera, at least in the green and red channels, but maybe not so much in the blue channel because the leftmost band will get both the LED continuum and a bright mercury vapor emission line. A similar filter I had never heard of is the DGM NPB. This filter is probably the best of the bunch, but it has a few issues. The transmission at H beta and S2 is respectively 60 and 37%, which is slightly disappointing, but not really a deal breaker because we're mostly interested in these filters to image broadband targets. The second issue, which is more serious, is that this filter is likely not a good choice if you have a refractor, because it lets a lot of signal through in the near UV, where most, if not all, refractors perform poorly because of their chromatic aberration. But with a reflecting telescope, this filter might actually perform fairly well, at least on paper. Let's finish off by looking at a few sets of RGB filters. I mentioned in my last video that most RGB filters on the market are designed to cut down some of the light pollution, and it is true to some extent if you choose to believe the marketing hype. For example, here are my Antlia RGB filters. As you can see, they reject a good chunk of light in the yellow part of the spectrum, targeting light emitted by low pressure and high pressure sodium street lights. But other than that, they don't do that much in terms of suppressing light pollution. Same thing with the astronomic deep sky RGB filters or even the chroma RGB filters. So is the situation hopeless? I don't think it is. First, I mentioned earlier that there are new narrowband LED lights on the market. They are likely still more expensive than the current generation of LED light fixtures, but their price might come down soon and I invite you to pressure your elected officials to adopt them because the light that they emit seems very easy to filter out and they emit in the yellow part of the spectrum, which is much better for human health and the wildlife. Second, I think that the ability to dim LEDs has not been used to its full extent. And I am planning to confirm this very soon with a series of spectra of my local light pollution taken throughout the night. Again, contact your elected officials and ask them what they are doing to conserve energy and your precious tax dollars and maybe offer the suggestion that streetlights could be dimmed in the latter part of the night or even completely turned off in some areas that experience little to no traffic. 
And finally, I think that there is room for a new type of filter, one that is better suited to the modern form of light pollution. And here is what it could look like. I named this filter the Dark Sky Geek Ultimate Light Pollution Suppression Filter. Its design attempts to cut the LED continuum as much as possible and also the well-known emission lines associated with artificial or natural light pollution, while still providing signal from the blue, green and red parts of the spectrum to provide a good color balance. It comes in three variations. This first variation works best with reflectors because it lets in a fair amount of signal in the near UV. I think this is good because most modern CMOS cameras are actually fairly sensitive in the near UV and the amount of light pollution in that part of the spectrum is relatively insignificant. Transmission is relatively high across all the transmission bands and 0% off band as you would expect. Also, most of the important lines that we care about such as H-beta, O3, H-alpha and S2 are included. And finally, I carefully rejected a few spectral lines caused by light pollution, like for example the mercury vapor line at 4047 angstrom. The second variation is for well-corrected refractors, for which we need to cut the near UV part of the spectrum or risk losing a fair amount of sharpness to chromatic aberration. And finally, the third variation is for budget refractors, like mine and maybe yours. In this case, we don't have much of a choice and we cannot include that much blue signal. Still, I expect this kind of filter to provide a significant boost in SNR when imaging broadband targets either with a monochrome camera or an OSC camera. If a filter manufacturer wants to build this filter, feel free to get in touch with me. I'd be glad to test it with my spectrophotometer and under my light polluted skies and report back. All right, that's all I've got for you today. I sincerely hope that these videos have been helpful to you guys. I'm probably going to stop testing filters for a while because I want to move on to other topics, but who knows, if something new and shiny appears on the market, I might take a look at it and maybe save you guys a bunch of money that could be best spent elsewhere. I have a lot of ideas for future videos, but no concrete plan just yet. Also, I'm going to go on vacation during the summer, so it may be a couple of months until the next video is published, but don't worry, I'll be back. If you don't want to miss future videos, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Give this video a like if you think that it deserves it, and maybe leave a comment below to share your experience with others. Until next time, thank you for watching!